The next speaker doesn't need uh, much introduction. Uh, Mary Mario is professor of, uh, in the graduate school, originally professor of architecture in UC Berkeley and former president of ERI. And speaking of ERI, I forgot to say one thing. Uh, you corrected me of having the Northridge uh, report in seven days. There is one more correction. The STEER report of Alaska was a joint effort between STEER and ERI, and we will hear more about that in the lunch talk tomorrow, so it should be interesting. So uh, Mary uh, will, uh, will give us the last uh, talk of this uh, session, uh, and it, it's a very interesting topic, uh, <coughs> looking back and looking forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I clearly never got the memo that we changed the, the peer um, logo from the original <laughs> one that says something about age. Um, but I'm gonna, I knew that Jack would do a lot of technical things, so I'm going to do what Steve Mann always says we do, which is see things from 30,000 feet. So my talk is a little bit different than the previous two. I try to have sort of three really big high-level lessons from Northridge, three things that we did. Um, in the last 25 years, and three things that we need to do looking forward. So that's the sort of the outline. So three big lessons. Modern buildings are still vulnerable. We, we learned a lot from Northridge, and Jack showed you many of those things, and we particularly learned a lot even about residential buildings, which we had somewhat discounted the wood frame construction before that. But even we're still learning from this and i think this is a really important lesson i mean the, the recent events in new zealand particularly kaikoura and the losses in wellington in um, precast concrete floors and brand new buildings that are now all being demolished is pretty shocking for us um, in this community and i think we have to be humble enough to recognize that we are still going to be learning from these things um, in future earthquakes and we really need to be vigilant uh, the second really important lesson from northridge in addition to being surprised by the damage in wood frame was just how significantly housing damage was undercounted sort of systematically um, and across the board in past earthquakes um, and really has a tendency to continue to be undercounted. And I think it's important because these, this chart on the top is the, you know, what we knew about tagging maybe I don't know, a couple of weeks after the earthquake. The problem is the tag colors change over time. And the building department doesn't track if there was a building that started out as a red tag and became green tag or started out as a yellow and became red. We, we don't know those things. So in fact, we really don't know what the actual, you know, we don't know what we saw and what we didn't see. And we don't know them by address. So we really don't know what we saw and didn't see. and we realize when we look at things like insurance claims on residential buildings, well, we counted something like, um, you know, these were units, 300,000, you know, multifamily units, but, and, and 64,000 sort of single family homes, but we had almost 300,000 FEMA grants to homes, we had almost 200,000 insurance claims worth $12.5 billion. Guess what? We never looked at all that residential damage after the earthquake. We never counted it. And to this day, we have no idea what the real numbers were for Northridge. Jack Boatwright and I have, from USGS, recently sadly passed away, have spent more time than anyone ever wants to think about trying to figure out these numbers. And we just don't know is the answer. And the same was true on multifamily. And I think that going forward, it tells us, you know, we had to pay a lot more attention. It was also the very first time that we actually geospatially mapped that damage and we coordinated it with social science data. We never had sort of economic, um, issues and, and social issues overlaid before. It was a, at the, you know, at the, in Pasadena where we were, all the data was being collected. It was the first time we were making those kinds of integrated maps. So the third lesson from Northridge is that Northridge, you know, we thought it was a big event for us. 
But it was not the big one. I mean, it was just such a small event compared to what the potential losses are from a major Hayward Fault scenario, a major um, Puente Hills scenario, um, John, in, you know, in, in Los Angeles. Um, and when we look at what's happened since, that very relatively short recovery period that happened in Northridge and Wenchuan and in Chile, those are the anomalies. They, those are not the norm. The norm is it takes 10 to 20 years for a community to recover. And these are just a few examples. Um, and we could, I can do it for just about every earthquake that's happened historically and come up with the same data. So recovery is slowed by a, the complex disruption of urban systems. When you have the, the damage kind of distributed and not heavy urban systems lost, power, water, infrastructure, it's easier, um, but also the greater the number of concentrated damage makes it slower to recover. So we've learned those, that, that was a huge and important lesson. Recovery wasn't something we studied in the same way we studied emergency management. We paid attention to damage, we paid attention to emergency, we, we, we learned from Northridge that we have to think about recovery. So what are the three biggies that we really did learn about in the last 25 years? The first is obviously mitigation. It was critical for loss reduction. And we made, in California, we made huge public investments in seismic upgrades and in research. Um, and it really was true not just in California because we had the Kobe earthquake a year later and, you know, that, it changed everything in the world, e-defense was built, et cetera. So we were part of the research wave that came about, but we also saw the state, Caltrans, investing in the bridges and in the freeways and in lots of research as well as in the retrofits. We saw bond issues for the BART system. We've seen um, a lot of retrofit of public buildings, not only ones that were damaged, like San Francisco City Hall and LA City Hall, but also UC Berkeley putting and starting the Disaster Resistant Universities program, which then became a sort of a national effort. So all of those things really grew with mitigation, grew because of Northridge. And it was really coupled with an understanding of downtime. This is a goofy slide, I couldn't figure out what picture to show. Um, and it was a little study that I did a long time ago where we looked at how recovery time increased with the percentage of the stock closed. Um, and the important thing about that was that those, the more, the greater proportion of your building stock, if you're a city, right, and you have 50% of your building, if you're of your central business district closed, it's a much bigger downtime than if you have 5% of your CDBG, CD central business district closed, but the dis damage is more distributed across other places. You really saw this in the Christchurch earthquake, obviously, um, was one of the examples of that. Um, and so this, the notion that downtime, that the time factor, uh, and Halid mentioned this in his introduction, time is really important and it's become something we have learned about and we are, you know, we learned how to define it, we learned how to model it, we learned how to talk about it, we've learned how to put it into our standards, etc. So the third big lesson in the past 25 years is, is I think that we have really we started with performance-based engineering and we made enormous progress in that, but we have also done something else, which is that we have taken performance-based engineering from the sort of the shake table and the system to the building, to the campus, and I think now to the whole community, to the city, to the notion that we are, we are not talking about the performance of just, well, we are, we're talking about the performance of this building, but we're also talking about the performance of UCLA, and we're also talking about the performance of the capacity of Los Angeles to recover and function after an earthquake. So this is another way of showing that same slide with some diagrams, but these are some of the things we've done technically, and the point is that we integrate that 
with these, um, with other kinds of models, with urban growth models, with cellular autonomy models, with um, event tree models, etc. Because it's that combination of models from other disciplines and our technical models that are giving us this larger framework. Which leads us to the last real lesson of the last 25 years, which was the beginning of what we're calling resilience planning. Um, we have very specific examples in the last 25 years um, with the, what happened in San Francisco and Los Angeles, um, the sort of introduction of resilience plans, of work with the uh, 100 resilient cities. There's a lot. LA Water and Power's long range 50 year plan for making the water system more resilient. These are all came about because of this transition. So um, if we want to really understand resilience, it's this bit, what is it? You know, what is this buzzword that everybody's doing it and nobody knows what it is? We, we've been talking about it here for a long time. We still talk about it. And we are, we wave, I wave my arms a lot. That's what I do. Um, but it's this, they, the, the definition is this capacity to survive and adapt what kind, no matter what kind of chronic stress. So we know it's a buzzword. Everybody seems to want to do something about it. But let's break, for us, there are three components. There's the research, and there's the policy, and there's the implementation. We do the research. Somebody else does the policy and the implementation. Not that we shouldn't talk to them, but we're the ones doing the research. Let's think about our part in this not what everybody else is doing. It's much simpler if we just, I mean, it's complicated enough just to do our part. So let's just talk about that. Um, I think there are two technical, <laughs> two questions for the technical community. How do we evaluate performance of a whole building and design and, and the building and the design for infrastructure systems, both existing and new, and for buildings, both existing and new, to significantly reduce losses in order to simplify and shorten recovery time. This is a change. This means structural and non-structural systems. This means the whole building functioning, not ceiling tiles down and us not able to have class in here. This means the water actually still comes on, the power still comes on. How do we model the interdependencies, which is an even harder problem among the systems, to reflect long-term performance? I think these are our research questions for the 25 years going forward. And this is Greg Deerline's slide. We, there was a, a NIST workshop, and a, Greg and I <laughs> had to, sat on the steering committee, which worked us way too hard. Um, for um, a, a study that said, what would it take for us to do residential and commercial buildings to, um, to a in immediate occupancy standard? And, you know, of course, this is about limiting loss and reducing, um, but we can't have resilience one building at a time, one bridge at a time, even one city at a time. If we want to be resilient in California, if we want our economy to do well, we have to think more broadly. So for us, can we devise resilience metrics? You know, is that possible? Can we model dynamic vulnerability over time? Different, how, how buildings grow and change over time? What do we know about those? These are both, this is some work from Christ After Christchurch with Ken Elwood. This is some work from David Lalamont, who was at Stanford, is now in Singapore. Um, I think there's some really interesting work going on in New Zealand um, looking at both why this sort of larger systems and functions matter. They have um, a project called Smart Seismic Cities and it's really trying to look at the technical components but, at, but linked with all <laughs> of the, the um, community actors, really, linked, really deeply integrated with the city, the business owners, the building owners, um, people who are real stakeholders who have a part. And they're really, it is about trying to Im not just imp improve that building code, but to make sure that the community and the city functions. And that's going to require some hard thinking about well, how do you do new construction and what do you do with older buildings and which ones do you retrofit and which ones do you just buy insurance for? Um, similarly, I have another project on the Alpine Fault looking at all of the interdependencies and in the infrastructure. 
and I and they're getting again the state the true stakeholder participation and data sharing etc I'm down to my last slide or two slides um, so that is I think that's a model for thinking about how we go forward I I see that in the in the goal that Khalid put up this morning but I think you need more on the inter and your I would put a third bullet point up there about this all this interdependencies work that would be my recommendation the infrastructure matters because of this interdependence we can't you know, we're we're going to function on the we're going to do with the physical part but all those physical things the energy the communication the dams um, the, the all those pieces we design link to our food and agriculture to our government to our banking to our information technology so we need them to be to work together and for Norm and for all of you guys in the geotech side, in the seismology and geotech side, we have got to figure out how to get this good data into land use planning. We really have, land use planning has punted since Northridge. Nothing has happened in planning very much. And that's a shame. We really have to start to think about parcel-based data. And it's not going to be easy, clearly. It's technically difficult. But it is how we're going to start to get real risk information into the public sphere. So the last slide. What, a, what we should be focusing on is safe and functional physical environments. This is our three-part kind of exercise and where I think our framework for resilience should be. The parts about equity and social and ecological re responsibility, about policy implementation, we shouldn't be ignoring them, but we should understand that we have colleagues in other fields who are going to really focus on these issues, and we need to talk to them and coordinate with them, but we do not need to do all their other parts. So when we think about resilience, let's focus on the part that we can have some input into. And with that, I think we have a lot to do in the next 25 years. Thank you.